Welcome to Four Speed Ahead. I'm Craig Fuller here with Matt Bernstein, the CEO of Hubtran. Matt, how are you today? I'm good, Craig. How are you today? Doing great. So, Matt, Hubtran is a company that provides software to help automate a lot of the manual uh, workflow that happens in this industry. Describe a little bit more about what you guys do to empower uh, folks that are in the industry that are providing services to, uh, to logistics uh, companies. Sure. So, uh, Craig, we're a relatively young company. We've been around five years. And uh, we, uh, we automate uh, back office work for transportation companies. And in particular, we serve uh, freight brokers and 3PLs. Uh, we also serve uh, a lot of the uh, transportation factoring industry. And um, more recently, we started serving uh, uh, the freight forwarders as well. And um, we really focus on, on one thing, which is uh, a lot of back office work related to the transaction. So think about kind of all of those documents and a lot of the manual work related to, uh, to payables and, and stuff like that. So why would a company uh, choose Hubtran over doing this, all of this in-house? Well, um, it's interesting. So when we started this up five years ago, I, I'd say uh, you know, there were a few companies, you know, typically the, only the very largest freight brokers that had built some kind of uh, in-house automation or using some of the kind of existing incumbent technologies to try and get some efficiencies. But, but uh, most companies really just, you know, struggle with this work because uh, they're receiving just a huge uh, quantity of incoming documents from carriers in a very chaotic way. And they're essentially kind of looking at these, these documents either on paper or, uh, you know, on kind of their screen, trying to, you know, save all these files, audit the payables relative to the load in the TMS, manage exceptions. Doing that manually is just extremely cumbersome and slow and pretty error prone as well. So we automate that for them. Uh, they save a ton of money. They go a lot faster. And uh, it's, it's, uh, it's just a, a really easy, you know, it's, it's a very clear value proposition. So Matt, Hubtran got its start in the factoring industry, a part of the transportation business that has a lot of exceptions and the paperwork has a lot of inconsistencies just by the nature of how factoring works. Do you think that really enabled you guys to build much better automation tools than perhaps existed in the market? Yeah, so we, we just took a completely different approach than uh, kind of the, the, the incumbent technology. So. The, the kind of current solutions or the, 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 uh, the older solutions really uh, relied on, you know, it's installed software. And there's maybe some workflow. Sometimes there's some OCR. Sometimes there's some templating to try to, uh, you know, kind of figure out what these documents are and pull information out of them. But the, the problem is that whether you're a, 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 a broker whether you're a forwarder, whether you're a, a, a factoring company, you're, there's millions, there's an unlimited supply of documents coming in, okay? And you can't template your way out of that. You can't hard code to each individual document. So, you know, kind of the, what we had to do is, you know, figure out how can we intelligently read these documents? So it's a combination of, of OCR, optical character recognition, which is really kind of just a, a foundation step. It only gets you maybe 10% of the way there. It lifts the text off the page. And then a lot of uh, AI and machine learning technologies to then kind of interpret that information and make sense out of it, combined with an integration on the back end. So, you know, that allows us to be very flexible. We can serve big companies, we can serve small companies, and on day one, it just, it just works. I had heard something astounding that as many as 50% of uh, freight that goes through factoring companies that are, are initiated by freight brokers actually have exceptions to them. Does that, is that something that you guys see as well? Yeah, um, if you look at a, a typical uh, uh, kind of uh, transaction, whether you're at a freight broker or a factoring company, um, and it's uh, you know, what we call happy path, where all the documents come in, they come in completely, uh, and all the information in those documents matches up uh, exactly to the load. In a manual environment, that may take a company, you know, uh, uh, not terribly long to process, maybe a minute or two. Of course, if you multiply that by, you know, 
thousands of transactions a day for a, an individual company, or even hundreds if you're a mid-sized broker, um, that's still a lot of work, right? Uh, but yeah, there's, uh, there's a tremendous uh, level of uh, kind of discrepancies. So you know, the wrong documents come in, incomplete document, illegible document, uh, an accessorial that wasn't anticipated, uh, you name it. And then you get into this back and forth where you have individuals calling and emailing and trying to resolve it. And, you know, we've, you know, not only are we flagging those exceptions up front, so you're not uh, kind of, you know, uh, either not getting paid by your customer or, or paying your carrier the wrong amount or, or some other problem. Uh, but, uh, you know, you can also kind of keep track and resolve those exceptions in a much more organized way. That is a huge problem. Is there any correlation to the size of the company in terms of the level of exceptions that they have to deal with? Does that does it really change the quality of the the, the actual paper that you guys are uh, helping those companies process? Uh, does that does that change anything in terms of how their processes work or the size of the organization? It really doesn't. In our experience, it's more the the, the nature of the work and how companies interact with their trading partners. So for example, um, we work with some 3PLs that tend to have, you know, they do a lot of volume, but they tend to work with a more consistent carrier base and, uh, and a, you know, a, a, a more limited set of customers, right? So it's very repetitive and everybody gets used to working with each other. So there's still a lot of kind of images and paper flowing back and forth, uh, but there's frankly not as many exceptions. On the other hand, uh, a, a lot of our freight broker customers are, you know, handling a lot of spot freight. They may, you know, they may work with ten or twenty thousand carriers in a given year, and a very good percentage of those carriers they're they're working with for the very first time, right? So, you know, that type of kind of spot freight environment just lends itself to a, a lot of disconnects, a lot of discrepancies that need to get resolved. Um, the other situation is that when you've got carriers that um, even when they're working with a carrier, sorry, when you've got freight brokers and three bills, even when they're working with a carrier on a consistent basis, but, um, you know, the, the, the pricing is not kind of a thousand dollars to move a load from A to B, but it's more complicated based on, uh, you know, kind of uh, number of units, number of pallets, uh, number of whatever, uh, weight, uh, fuel surcharges, things like that. Uh, things start to get out of whack again, and there's a lot of discrepancies. I would imagine on the truckload side, uh, detention's a pretty uh, big issue for uh, just the amount of work that it takes to resolve whether the truck was detained properly, whether there was proper check-in processes. Is that something that you guys also hear from your clients as well? There's all sorts of, of exceptions. So the, the first class of exception is just you know, uh, getting all the paperwork right so you can pay the carrier and have confidence that when you invoice your customer, uh, it, you're, you're doing it correctly. But then, um, yeah, loads rarely go, you know, exactly as expected. So um, there's, there's detention, there's layovers, there's, uh, in particular, there's a lot of un unloading charges and companies don't know what those unloading charges are until they actually get that that you know lump receipt, which is you know kind of scanned like this, and you know very tough to read. They get lost all the time, and so yeah, you know we're we we work to you know give companies the right technology to you know kind of flag those issues and resolve them very easily. Now the model that you guys have is a software company. You're really providing. Is it a is it charged on a uh, per transaction basis? Is it charged on a monthly basis? How do you guys approach your customers to help them solve these, these significant payables issues? Yeah, so we, you know, we try and keep it as simple as possible uh, because when we started five years ago, uh, no one heard of us, right? And so um, we needed to make it a, an easy decision for companies to kind of trial and use HubTrans. So pricing is purely transactional. Uh, we charge per invoice that they process through HubTran. We, we don't care if it, you know, that invoice has 100 pages associated with it or, or, or two pages associated with it. And then it's really easy for a customer to say, okay, you know, I'm, I'm uh, you know, this is a $1,500 load. You know, I've got a 15% gross margin on it. You know, I can afford to pay, you know, whatever it is, 50 cents to uh, automate this work and, and save a few dollars of, of labor and also probably save, 
you know, five to seven days of cash flow because you're getting those invoices out the door faster to your customers. Now, when I was in trucking, I don't know if this has changed, but uh, we had talked about on an average, just to bill a client and get it out the door, on average, that was anywhere from 12 to $18. Now, that was 20 years ago. I don't know if that's changed. Uh, what, what do you guys consider for a company what the average cost of sending a bill and an invoice is? So it, it really depends on how kind of expansively you look at it. Um, again, kind of in, in the spirit of keeping it simple, what we'll do when we go into, a, let's just say, a typical kind of 3PL freight broker is look at their back office team and see how many invoices every kind of, you know, in total they're processing per day. What we find is that typically it's, uh, you know, 60 to 80 invoices per person per day. And sometimes, you know, we'll, we'll get a company that says, well, you know, look, you know, our, how productive we are. We've only got four people doing this work. And we'll, you know, it's a lot, it was a lot easier to do, to figure this out when we were uh, able to visit companies on site. But, you know, then you look at it and say, well, what are all those people doing across, you know, you know, across the hall? Oh, well, that's, you know, that's our customer billing department. And what you find is that, you know, customer billing is then kind of looking at that same paperwork and making sure that all of their kind of, each customer has specific requirements, what they get in their invoice, and they're kind of fixing all this stuff on the back end. So we look at that collectively, like what is their customer billing and their payables department consist of? And typically it's going to be about 60 to 80 invoices per person per day. With Hubtran, they should be getting to at least 300 or more invoices per person per day. So, you know, if you look at kind of one person, let's just say fully loaded cost, 20 bucks an hour, that's 160 bucks a day for a person. If they're doing 80 invoices kind of at the high end, if you're manual, that's two bucks an invoice. Now, if you also add in, you know, some of these companies, a lot of them get backlogged in terms of getting that paperwork organized so they can invoice their customer. If you're, if you're burning a week on that, that's another dollar in, in, in cash flow. So that's $3 that is like super tangible that you can just kind of eliminate quite, you know, or at least take down dramatically. I mean, you talked about the fact that you're saving money by automating it. You've also mentioned cash flow, which everybody that's in and around trucking knows that that's the number, you know, cash is literally king in this industry. Uh, what, what do you see the turnaround time and the acceleration for speeding those invoices through and helping them get out the door and into the hands of shippers or brokers for that matter? Yeah. So, you know, we, we set up a lot of metrics uh, so our customers can see how they're doing every day because they're using the technology, right? And um, ideally, the, the way this works is that, you know, the paperwork comes in from the carrier, it gets processed that day, and that converts into an invoice, and that invoice goes out that day. And so you, you get out of this kind of uh, chain of events where you know one person is kind of doing all this data entry, and then another person is kicking over these exceptions to the dispatcher to research, and then another person is checking the invoice to make sure it's good before it goes out. So ideally, this is a, a almost a, an instantaneous process because there's just, you know, we're taking away a lot of work and making it a much more just, uh, uh, you know, streamlined event where it's one person touching it and not a series of people. Now, Matt, when I recruited a CFO from outside of our industry, we're a SaaS company at heart, and uh, he's been in a number of technology companies. He was shocked when I described all of the processes and the amount of humans it takes to get in the trucking industry to, to get, you know, frankly, bills out the door. Um, is that something that surprised you when you came in the industry, just how much human activity is still involved in a billing and collections process? It was incredibly shocking to me, and I had kind of a, a firsthand experience with it because um, I've been working in big companies and, you know, kind of, when you're working in a big company, you rarely come face to face with uh, a lot of these processes like, you know, kind of the, the back office, right? It's kind of out, out of sight, out of mind. And then I decided that I had had enough of big companies. I started up a 3PL and it was doing pretty good. It was growing. But then as we kept, you know, as we bring on new customers, we'd say, well, geez, we need to bring on another another accounting person, another clerk to do, you know, handle all of this paperwork. And even if it's not paperwork, even if it's images on a screen, it's still very repetitive. and I just couldn't believe it. And so I started, you know, interviewing 
uh, kind of some of the existing uh, solutions providers out there just was really dissatisfied with what I saw. It was kind of like a dog with a bone and got really interested in the problem. And uh, we thought we had a better way of approaching it. It's, it's amazing uh, when, you, when you think about all of the stuff that takes place. At one point, I, we had counted, it was as many as 12 people on a, on, a, on a load that actually doesn't have a ton of exceptions. On average, about 12 folks are involved. If you have exceptions and issues, it can be many, many larger, uh, exponentially larger number of human touches to a typical freight uh, transaction. When you think about a lot of the conversation around digitization and digitizing the freight industry, I always wonder, until we solve this problem of eliminating the human touches, not just the matching of the truck and the, uh, and the uh, load, but the actual, all of the exceptions that take place, until we eliminate that, it's gonna be very hard to Uberize it, digitize it, whatever your term is. Well, and, and just in terms of Uberizing, I mean, even the, uh, you know, kind of Uber freight digital, you know, freight matching companies have, have, have this problem with paperwork, okay? This is not something that, uh, you know, anybody has kind of just waved a magic wand at and it's gone away. So, um, I, but I think that every, you know, five years ago when we started, it was not on kind of the CFO's radar uh, at these companies, but it, but it is now. And... Um, it's something that you know every company needs to think about because you don't want your people doing really boring, repetitive, error-prone work. It's just not the way to grow your business. And and you're right, there's a ton of hidden costs out there. So one of the things that we're tackling right now is, so you mentioned that we serve factoring companies and we serve freight brokers, and these companies are transacting all the time. And so a very common but very hidden cost is these factoring companies are verifying invoices before they purchase them because they want to make sure that load details match the invoice they're getting or they're not going to get paid. And then often they call after they've invoiced a broker to make sure that uh, there aren't any issues. So they're calling two or three times. And I mean, that's incredibly painful for the factoring company, incredibly painful for the brokerage. And because we're serving kind of both sides of the transaction, you know, we're automating a lot of that now. And I do think that you kind of have to get into the details and you know really figure out you know how can we how can we streamline this work for all of these participants? And it's not like you know the industry has been avoiding or is afraid of technology, but when you've got this hyper fragmented multi party structure, right? You've got hundreds of thousands of carriers, ten thousand plus brokers, factoring companies, a bazillion shippers. Um, you know, it, settling this and then you know settling these transactions in an efficient way is hard to do. Yeah, it's an it's an amazing, uh, still a, a business that still has so much legacy uh, workflow, we legacy history in it. And if you talked about all of the parties that have to be streamlined, it's going to take a while before we see true digitization. Matt, when when we talk about you know one of the things I always like to explore as a founder is what it's like starting a SaaS business in this space. What was the founding team like uh, when you guys set out to solve this problem? Well, um, it was basically, uh, so I had some business experience in this area and was trying to solve the problem with a, a, a few different technology providers, did not make a lot of headway. So I knew where I wanted to get to, uh, but was, uh, you know, you, you really need the right team. and. Uh, uh, kind of just by happenstance, got connected with uh, with two people. I'll share their names because you know they're very you know they're very not only they're very talented, but they've been great team members and have helped me grow this company. So Mike Mangino and Michael Niesner. Uh and so they really had a once they understood the the business problem that we were trying to solve, they really had a vision for how we could do it from a, kind of the, the technology side of things. It started off with uh, just you know a handful of us and. We've kept the, the team pretty lean. Uh, we're about you know 35 strong right now, primarily software engineers. Uh, but uh, we've tried to kind of keep that original vision where our technology people are really closely connected to the problem we're trying to solve and to our customers. Have you guys raised uh, venture capital? Yeah, we we've raised we've raised some venture capital. Uh, we've been super capital efficient, so we haven't had to raise a lot. And I think uh, you know we'll probably raise some more uh, because we've got some pretty 
big ambitions, but uh, but we're uh, again, you know, not uh, we're not one of those companies that wants to raise a hundred million dollars and kind of you know solve the world's problem. We we're really focused on the transportation back office. What is it like going from a, you mentioned you were at a large company before, uh, your background has been at a number of, of large organizations. What's it like going from a large Fortune 500 company or even bigger to a startup that, you know, you, you eat what you kill uh, scenario? Yeah. What's that like? So there, there are two really big differences. So one is that in my, in my prior role, I was running, you know, a variety of functions, so kind of strategy, capital planning, uh, uh, procurement, supply chain. And so, you know, I, I was dealing with a $10 billion budget, right? So a lot of zeros kind of after every decision. Um, and when you're starting up, uh, a, 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 you know, a, a new venture, um, you just don't have that scale, right? But your customers are still counting on you to deliver value. So it's every bit as important. But the, the nice thing about being in a startup is I don't have all those uh, kind of board meetings and steering committees and uh, everything else to get something done. You know, we're very aligned. And yeah, you know, you know we, we figure out kind of the problem to be solved. We, you know, we, we, we build it and then we can see our customers use it. And, you know, kind of that direct line of kind of cause and effect is very, very gratifying. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's, a, it's fascinating. Uh, I can't imagine ever, uh, frankly, going to work in a, in a company that, that I'm not involved in as an executive. I imagine being venture capital back that the day will come when um, I, ha I have to make a choice to fire myself or, or risk getting fired by the uh, buying company. But regardless of that, that's okay. Um, it is a different environment moving from, I remember when I moved from my dad's company to uh, to my first startup, it was it, a lot of that infrastructure was there, customers were there. It's completely different. Growing an intrapreneurship uh, organization is very different than an uh, entrepreneurship organization that's outside of a big company. Yeah. So anytime you're moving from a, a big enterprise to uh, you know, somewhat smaller venture, um, you, you don't have, you know. Uh, all of these kind of vast resources at your disposal, right? So you, you've, you've, got, you've got your team, you've got your partners, you've got your customers. And um, at least in our space, we've got a ton of opportunities, right? But you can't go after all those opportunities. So kind of being super disciplined about prioritizing the most important things to do for our customers is, is probably job one. And it's something that we still struggle with, you know? Um, you know I, so I remember, for example, uh, about five years ago, uh, just getting started, you know, we had this vision that, you know, kind of we, we would automate payables and then payments would flow directly from that. And we actually started building it. And after uh, maybe a couple months of building it and talking with our customers, we thought, well, look, you know, nobody's ever heard of us. Are they really going to, you know, they're trusting us with payables automation. Are they really going to trust us with their, their you know, the, the money in their bank? And um, is this, you know, is this diverting resources from really building kind of just a, a, a killer, you know, payables automation technology and decided to pull back from that. And subsequently, you know, we're partnered with kind of some of the leaders in that space, uh, you know, Triumph Pay and others. And so, yeah, you can't do everything. You just have to pick the things that you're going to be really great at and, and excel, excel there. It's hard for entrepreneurs because we want to solve the world's problems. We want to solve so many things. I, I think that was a wise move, Matt, not or staying as a small company, staying out of the, the payment workflow or actually originating the payments, I should say, because you guys are in the payment workflow. You're just not actually handling the money movement. Um, I ran a small payment processor, and it was very difficult for us to compete on large deals for the reason you stated, which is we were an unknown company without a track record, and people are, you know, CFOs are saying, why would I trust you in my business? So I think that's, I certainly applaud that. You guys have recently expanded into the global market, which is, you know, very different, has a lot of similarities to the domestic market, but in many ways has a lot of nuances that are quite different. What is the, the plans to really build that out? And, and how do you guys, uh, what's your go-to-market plan in that particular space? Sure. So um, we've been, it, it's really interesting. It, you know, I think if from the outside looking in, you'd look at a forwarder, and you'd look at a, a freight broker and say, well, gosh, they're doing the same thing, right? They're moving freight from point A to point B. Um, well, the fact is that, you know, global forwarders are 
you, you know, it's, it's typically multi-load movements where you've got uh, a, a truck move, then an air or ocean move, then another truck move. And the fact that these, uh, these shipments are crossing borders just introduces a lot of complexity for them. So there's a, a very worthwhile problem to be solved. Um, we, uh, I, I'm, I'm pretty happy that the way we've started because we've got a few small companies that we kind of started with, burned in the offering, and now we're actually serving um, uh, use in logistics, which is one of the top 20 global freight forwarders, and we're off to a great start with them and hope to sign on a lot more companies like that. We, uh, we have our core team here in North America. We hired our, our kind of first uh, business leader outside of North America, so uh, somebody who's really deep in the space based in Singapore. And um, we think we will have to have kind of a, a global footprint to really serve these companies. But the most important thing was getting the technology right um, and understanding how their operations, how their kind of document and back office processes are different than, than 3PLs. And that was, that was job one. And that took us, took us a while to really kind of build the technology that, that fits the forwarder operation perfectly. You've got a pretty impressive uh, roster of clients. Uh, you've got about 300 clients that you, you've worked with. It's a five-year-old business. It's a, a pretty aggressive growth rate just in that period of time. What do you credit that to? It's all about the, it's all about the product, I think. Um, you know, we're, we're using this combination, it, you know, we're, we're completely, uh, you know, it's, a, it's pure SaaS, right, web-based, um, and that provides a lot of kind of conveniences relative to kind of the, you know, old school uh, on-prem software, okay? But, but beyond that, being able to kind of deliver OCR and machine learning kind of uh, in a, in a, 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 with a browser-based application, right? that just effortlessly bolts onto a company's operating system, their TMS, um, and kind of on day one, all their users need is kind of their, their username and password to get started, and it just works. I mean, it, it's all, at the end of the day, it's all about the product. Now, we, we try and do a good job with, you know, kind of customer support and, uh, you know, all the other kind of nice things, but it, it starts with having that, that killer product. Is there a lot of churn in your customers? I mean, I imagine with once you get the pay, once because it is payments and you're automating, I imagine there isn't a significant churn issue that you guys have in your SaaS business. We, we've had almost zero churn. The only real churn that we've had um, is when one of our customers, you know, there's more and more M and A activity in, in the in the marketplace. So occasionally. Um, you know, we'll be working with one company that are on this TMS, and then they get acquired, and they have to switch to a kind of another company that's not using us, and we're not integrated with their TMS or whatever. So we feel like, oh, okay, we have to we have to start over. But typically, that actually works in our favor. I would imagine uh, when a company that you are installed with, or is installed with you, I should say, uh, ends up buying another competitor, that's actually a huge benefit for you. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, it, it's kind of fun when, you know, these two companies come together and then they get to compare, well, you were doing it this way and we're doing it this way, and it can be a real eye-opener. So, um, yeah, it's, uh, we, we've had a really loyal customer base. And, in fact, you, you know, I, I mentioned that we, we have a very lean team around, you know, 30, 35 people. The uh, vast majority of those folks are, uh, are, are software engineers, right? So kind of the, the, the business commercial uh, folks, my, myself included, just a handful of us. And I think at some point we're going to want to kind of beef up our sales team, but uh, really um, uh, we're pouring so much of our resources into just building great product. And, and a lot of our growth has come from just kind of customers t uh, telling each other about Hubtran. Now, Matt, before we go, I have to ask you some of your thoughts about 2020. This has been an insane <laughs> year. Was the COVID quarantine, people working from home, did that actually drive new business to you guys? Or, or did it slow things down just because your customers or potential prospects were just trying to get a handle on the market? Well, both. So uh, there was a period, right, um, March, April, May in particular, where uh, most companies really said, we're not going to do anything except for the you know, kind of most business critical projects. And so, um, you know, our sales efforts really kind of slowed down quite a bit during those three months. And as you know, there was just a lot of choppiness in the market as well. 
um, and because we price transactionally, you know, we feel that. So when a customer's revenues go da- goes down because they're shipping less, you know, our revenues go down too. And that's, uh, you know, I, I think that works great for our customers, but, uh, you know, it can be painful in the short term. But subsequent to that, I mean, we've been growing at a, a greatly accelerated pace. And I think it is because companies are saying, hey, you know, we, we've got to figure out how to be more resilient, uh, more just, you know, kind of more effective with our people and uh, obviously kind of working remotely when you can digitize uh, this work um, and automate it, it helps tremendously. So yeah, we've been on a, we've been on a terrific tear the back half of the year. So without really talking about your business specifically, how would you describe the market uh, sort of the, we're now in peak or we're right, I don't know if we're directly in peak today, but we're moving towards peak. How would you describe the the market uh, in terms of Q4 2020. Well, I've never been, uh, you know, too uh, too great at making predictions, Craig, especially about the future. Um, but uh, you know, the market seems healthy right now. I mean, you know, there's uh, obviously, uh, you know, a lot of companies are having a tough time finding trucks, even. But um, you know, we see our customers having, uh, I think, a lot of courage to kind of reinvest in their business, which is very positive. We certainly are reinvesting in our business. But um, I still think there's, you know, a lot of uh, uh, a lot of unknowns out there uh, in our, you know, kind of both the kind of, you know, the pandemic situation and uh, and uh, the economic situation. So, you know, we'll see. 2020 has given us a lot of black black swan elements. Uh, and we're not out of the woods yet. Uh, we we have a lot to, you know, this this next couple of months is going to be interesting. And then we have next year, and who knows what that looks like. Well, Matt, really appreciate you coming on today. Four speed ahead. Uh, enjoyed having you. Best of luck finishing out the rest of the year. Uh, best of luck in your new global rollout. How can people get in touch with you? Sure. So um, I'll give them a really easy way to get in touch. Just sales at hubtrend.com, and we follow up right away. Thanks. All right. Thanks, Matt. Appreciate you coming on today. 